Hello, and welcome to The Excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. With the advent of AI tools like ChatGTP, cheating in college has become more accessible, prevalent, and for some students, less ethically troubling. However, cheating has always been an issue in education. How much of a factor is AI playing here? And isn't learning how to use AI in preparation for entering the workforce, where that skill is essential, a good thing? To answer these and other questions, I'm now joined by Beth McMurtry, a senior writer at the Chronicle of Higher Education. Thanks for joining me, Beth. Glad to be here. How are college students currently using AI tools in their academic work? Well, the really interesting thing that I've found in my reporting is that students are starting to use AI as an all-purpose tool. And by that, I mean they're using it as a search engine, they're using it to start papers and projects, they're summarizing the readings that they're being assigned, they're using it to brainstorm, they're using it to quiz themselves in preparation for tests, and they're using it to revise their own writing. I think that's a really fascinating transition that we're seeing in this era, um, era of technology where it's not just Google anymore. We're really shifting everything over to AI. In that same vein, are there instances where students or even institutions struggle to define the line between acceptable AI use and academic dishonesty? Yes, absolutely. This is a huge debate in higher education right now because there are some obvious red lines, right? Like everybody knows that you should not use AI to write your paper for you, to complete your homework or to do an exam. But there are a lot of gray areas right now that even professors can't agree on. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. Is it okay to use AI uh, to brainstorm ideas for a paper or a research project? What if you pick one of the ideas from the list that AI gives you? Are you outsourcing your thinking to AI? What if you did your own research, but you're not quite sure how to organize the material most effectively into a paper? Can you upload it and ask ChatGPT to give you help? Or is that cheating? What if you put your final paper into AI and then you asked it to, hey, find the weaknesses in my arguments um, or give me a counter argument to, to something I wrote? Um, again, is that outsourcing thinking? And you know, there are some professors who say, that's all totally fine. AI is your study buddy, AI is your tutor, you're using AI the, may, the way you might use a friend or even a professor to help you think something through and sharpen your writing. But other professors say absolutely not, that the learning process itself means going through this hard and difficult work of trying to wrestle with ideas and, and articulate them in the best possible way. So this is where we are right now, I think, when it comes to ethical usage of AI. Let's step back and talk about cheating in general. It's not new, but how is AI potentially making it easier to cheat? And are there disciplines where we're seeing more of a rise than others? Well, we know, obviously, that cheating has been around forever. Students have always cheated in some form or another. And the reasons why they cheat pretty much have remained the same over time. You wait too long to start a paper. You're totally lost in the class you think this assignment's a waste of time or you feel like everyone else is cheating. Those are some really common reasons why students cheat. If you have AI at your fingertips, it's going to be a lot easier to act on that impulse. You're not gonna have to say, pay somebody to write a paper for you or write exam answers down on your hand and hope that you don't get caught in class. So some of the ways that I have heard professors talk about where they're seeing cheating it really runs the gamut. There are a lot of um, low stakes ways in which students are cheating. By that, I mean it, the professor might just ask you to respond to a short prompt after you you know, read the reading for class just so that they know that you read it and maybe ask you to respond to a couple of other students' comments. It's, it's a very common strategy, and it's one that a lot of students don't like. They think it's a waste of time. So more and more professors are finding that these so-called discussion boards are just useless because students are just running the prompts through AI and doing it. They're using it to turn in homework. They're using it for take-home quizzes. You know, writing has gotten a lot of attention in the press. You know, the, the, the AI-generated writing, the writing that professors can tell isn't really authentic. But the fact is that AI can do a lot of things really well. It can explain concepts in chemistry and biology. It can write computer code. And interestingly, um, there's some data to back up the idea that maybe it's actually more used in STEM 
for cheating. Um, Anthropic, which runs the Claude um, AI, did a study of how students use um, Claude, and they found that STEM students are the most frequent users. The number one discipline in which students were using AI was computer science. They, they made up 37% of conversations with Claude, but computer science students only represent about 5% of U.S. De- degrees. And you could say, well, they are, you know, maybe they're just using it to study for their computer science test. But um, Anthropic actually found that students tend to, to use it more for what they call higher order functions, like creating things or analyzing things, not for like the memorization or the quizzing kinds of functions. So that is a suggestion that in the space of cheating, it, we might be seeing actually a lot of underreported cheating in STEM and in computer science in particular. Are students properly being taught about biases or inaccuracies when using AI? That's a really good question. I think a lot of professors still aren't talking about AI in class. So I think the short answer might be no. I would say that your average student probably is aware that AI does spit out biases or makes up things that we call them hallucinations. But in terms of actually how to use AI well and how to use AI effectively and how to spot, like um, sometimes within a longer written text of AI, it could take a left turn and start making things up or misanalyzing something. And your average student, uh, particularly if they're just starting out in a field, they're not going to be able to recognize when AI is just embedding some strange um facts or non-facts in in a large larger piece of work. It really takes sort of an expert eye to to see through all of that. Beth, if students or educators express concerns to you about growing dependence on AI for writing, problem solving, creating ideas? Yeah, I mean, their professors are hugely concerned. In this one um, survey of instructors that I looked at recently, 82% of respondents said that they were really concerned about students' um, ability to critically evaluate AI output, and 82% were worried that students might become too reliant on AI. And I'll, I will say that students share the same concern. Um, they turn to it because it's easy and it's useful. It is very useful for a lot of what students want to do, but they also know that it's almost a little too easy. I've been doing some reporting on this, and when I talk to students, um, they often wonder if their brains are actually getting less exercise. One student actually said to me, I think my brain is breaking a little bit by, by so much AI use. And how is AI integrated into teaching now? Well, right now, the short answer is that it's not. Um, uh, That same survey that I referenced shows that only about 18% of faculty say they understand how to apply it in their teaching. So I think, again, it's by and large not talked about in most college classrooms. But I will say that there are more professors who are at least talking about it in a casual way with students. They're putting it on their syllabus, for example, I don't want you to use any AI in this class, or you can use it in a certain uh, assignment, but not in others, or some of them are letting students just use it however they want. There are some basic moves that I've heard a lot of professors are using. For example, um, they might ask a student to write an essay and then um, use AI to write an, an essay on its own. And then they contrast their own writing with the AI's writing. And they, the students can sort of see places where, oh, the AI might be grammatically perfect, but it totally missed the point, or it was really bland. Another interesting um, way of teaching about AI without having to have a lot of expertise is they might ask the student, you know, have AI write about something that you really know very well. Maybe it's music, maybe it's sports. And the student then, who's sort of an expert in this field, can actually read this and understand maybe how shallow or how deep the AI is. So on a more sophisticated level, those professors who really have taught themselves AI and are really thinking through how to use it as um, as an, a study aid or a, what one professor called a cognitive amplifier, they're actually having students engage with AI in, say, an assignment. So maybe, again, it, it goes back to what I was saying before. They might upload some of their writing and ask AI to critique it. They might put out a question to ChatGPT as they're researching a problem and ask ChatGPT for its thoughts, and they might sort of work with that to guide their own thinking. 
I think in those instances, what the professors are trying to show students is if you are in control of the tool and you don't just let the tool do the work for you, it can actually be a great device. But I think a lot of professors aren't quite there yet. A lot of them don't feel very comfortable using AI at a very high level. And what about what students are saying? This has to be very confusing for them without having clear direction on when it's okay to use AI and when it isn't. Yes, um, students are very concerned that they might be accused of cheating with AI. So obviously there are those students who do misuse AI, but there are, I think, are many more students who aren't sure where the lines are. And I think this goes back to kind of the inconsistency that they see among their professors. Some hate it and they ban any use. Even if you were to search something on ChatGPT, they would think that that's not okay. And others are saying, go for it, use it however you want. So when they do use it as a study tool, for example, or when they do run their paper through ChatGPT just to catch grammatical errors, they're wondering, am I going to get caught? And we know that more and more colleges are using monitoring devices, you know, to sort of to prevent cheating in class. So what if a professor ran your paper through, say, this app called Turnitin, and it said it, there was a likelihood that you cheated. I mean, students are going to panic and worry that their professor might think that they used AI when they didn't, even if it's not a definitive um, conclusion that they did, in fact, use AI. I was going to ask, at the macro level, what kinds of policies are colleges putting into place regarding AI? I think they're doing a number of different things. One of the first areas where they really tried to tackle this had to do with academic integrity policies. It took a while for them to sort of figure out how they were going to wrestle with that because traditional forms of plagiarism don't really match what AI does. You know, you're not copying somebody else's work. AI is creating work for you. So I think they've kind of got that academic integrity aspect um, locked down. The problem is it Again, it's really hard for professors sometimes to know when students have used AI, even when they feel like students have misused AI. Sometimes they would rather simply talk to the student about it than turn them over to the academic integrity office and go through all the bureaucracy of trying to sort that out. The other way in which colleges are, are approaching AI is they're actually buying the tools or licensing the tools for their students on the idea that, look, you're all graduating into a world that's increasingly being infused with AI, so we would rather be able to um, give you safe and secure tools that you can use as your professors see fit or as you see fit in your research and your studying, um, and we want equitable access for everybody on this campus, so we're going to to pay OpenAI or some other company for access to a variety of tools. So it really runs the gamut. Finally, based on your reporting, what are the long-term implications of AI in higher education, not just for learning, but for ethics, equity, and trust in the academic system? Well, I mean, I think right now we're in a period of what I would say is sort of chaos and a lot of doubt. We know that the public is already very skeptical of the value of higher education. And there's this idea out there now, which I actually think is incorrect, that you can cheat your way through college. I think that's exaggerated. But it does feed the narrative, um, the public narrative, that higher education is probably not worth the money. So I think what's going to happen in the long term is that AI will really force colleges to rethink what is taught and, and how it's graded. There's a saying among education reformers to focus on the process and not the product. Um, and by that, what they mean is if you're only looking at how well students did on an exam or a paper, you're really not paying attention to kind of how they got to that point. So focus less on that final paper and start bringing that whole process into the classroom. So I think what we're going to see are, is more interactive work, more project-based work, more collaborative work. If you are asked to do a paper, for example, you might spend one class period talking about research ideas and you're brainstorming with your classmates. And then the next week you might bring in the outline and then debate that with your professor, or your classmates. So the professor can see how you're moving along. Your classmates can see how you're moving along. And it's less about, hey, just go off and write this paper and bring it back to me and I'll tell you whether or not you got a good grade on it. I think that is the probably the key way that educators can assure parents and society and students themselves that they're actually engaged in the process of learning 
The problem there is obviously that is pretty time intensive. It can be difficult to do in a large class. We know a lot of introductory classes are quite large, but it is a real challenge and it's something where higher education is really going to have to wrestle this issue to the ground. It's good to have you on the excerpt, Beth. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.